Thank you for tuning into this talk about threat intelligence. My name is Xander Bouwman. I'm a PhD candidate at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. And I'm speaking on behalf of a team of colleagues that carried out this work uh, from my institution, from the University of Potsdam and from Leiden University. Now let's say that you've lost your car keys. And in order to find them back, um, three different private investigators are offering their services. Each of them is asking for a different price and in order to know who to hire, you would have to know more information about them. For example, um, what experience do these investigators have with similar cases? Or what special capabilities do they have access to to help find back your car keys? Now, um, this is what we refer to as a market with asymmetric information. The sellers know what they are selling, but the buyers don't know what they are buying. A similar situation occurs in the market for commercial threat intelligence. We know from surveys that have been carried out in the past that um, uh, buyers in this market are struggling to compare the different commercial threat intel vendors. That asymmetry is something that we are trying to address with this work. Threat intelligence, um, there's lots of definitions. This is our working definition. Um, threat intelligence includes an IP address of a C2 server. It includes a hash of known malware. And it could come to you also in the form of a report, a PDF, written in natural language that describes the tactics of um, a certain threat group. For example, how they carry out phishing operations. An organization that wants to have threat intelligence could gather it from their own network, their own experiences or they can get it from external sources. They can get it from uh, open sources, meaning that it's freely available on the web, uh, such as Blockless. They can get it from sharing societies, which can be as simple as a Slack community, for example, uh, in which uh, information is exchanged on the basis of quid pro quo. You give some and you get some. Um, or you can buy it commercially. And... Um, the third option, the, uh, the paid threat intelligence, is what we are assessing in this paper. We are the first to uh, describe these in academic research, these paid sources, um, probably because they are really expensive. Um, some major providers, as you see here on the left, ask upwards of $100,000 per year. Um, and we speculate that this is the reason why they're not described in academic research yet. So we ask... What do these services consist of? How are they different from open sources? And um, customers that have bought them in the past, uh, what are they using these services for? And uh, how are they evaluating them? We analyzed the services uh, uh, of two leading providers, six years worth of their, da of their data. We cannot uh, identify um, the vendors specifically. That was the condition on the basis of which we could carry out this research. Um, but we can say that they are at the top end of the market and therefore we are confident in saying that um, these vendors are uh, representative for commercial threat intelligence as a whole. Further, we compared uh, those sources with six open source block lists and also we spoke to 14 professionals that are using paid threat intelligence in their work. Important limitations of our work include that we did a relative comparison only, meaning that um, we uh, did not attempt to compare to ground truth. And also, we analyzed our interviews uh, using grounded theory, meaning inductively, uh, and only in order to contextualize our findings. We did not generalize to the, ge to the global population of security specialists. If you're a customer of one of these vendors that we have analyzed, you might receive on average uh, each month about 100 threat reports of uh, various flavors and also um, 2,500 uh, machine readable indicators would be attached to those reports. There are other intelligence products um, listed here that we describe in the paper. On the left, you see um, an overview of the uh, sectors that um, the vendors are saying are affected by the threats that they describe in the reports. 
So the third most prevalent sector is civil society, which is surprising because civil society um, organizations are not really in a position to pay for these expensive uh, threat intel sources. And we speculate that this is because uh, perhaps attacks against civil society carry some um, special political significance. So if two threat intelligence vendors are describing the same threats, you might expect that they come up with the same data. But we find that this is not the case. Just 13% of the indicators of one of the vendors shows up in the data of the other vendor. And vice versa, it's only 1.3%. So um, the sets of one of the vendors was much larger. In order to better understand these findings, we looked at 22 threat actors that, according to their own metadata, um, these vendors are tracking. And specifically for these uh, uh, threat actors, we looked at what, what indicators were available in the uh, sets of the, ven of the vendors um, and how much overlap there was. The overlap between um, the different vendors, the two vendors, is shaded in um, the middle of these bars. And on average, for uh, each of the indicator types, there was no more than 4% overlap, even for specific threat actors that both of the vendors are saying that they're tracking. This raises some questions about the coverage that these vendors are providing. So there's not so much overlap. What does that say about um, the visibility that these vendors are providing of the threat landscape as a whole, or even for the specific threat actors that they say they are targeting? Now, um, comparing with open sources, there are more differences. Um, um, open sources are almost entirely different. There's almost no overlap. Uh, this indicates that uh, commercial threat intelligence really does capture a different part of the threat landscape. Um, in terms of timeliness, we did a comparison, um, which we have to say was based on this very small overlap, and it shows delays uh, both ways of about one month. There was no evidence that the uh, paid indicators were faster, but again, this was uh, based on this very small overlap. In terms of substance, looking at those reports, um, we saw that um, actually these reports often included also open source information. So a paid report might include um, information from an independent security researcher's blog, or we even saw screenshots of tweets directly being copied into reports. Um, we spoke to customers of these uh, commercial sources, and they described open sources as the raw uh, intel, uh, versus the paid sources as the polished intel. Previous research has identified um, all kinds of uh, performance metrics for block lists and for threat intelligence feeds. Um, again, uh, this is also why I'm speaking about coverage. But customers don't actually seem to care so much about coverage. They're not optimizing for detection. Um, customers are... Uh, actually not talking about metrics at all so much. Only half of the customers mention metrics um, by themselves. Um, but if they mention metrics, it's almost always uh, false positives. And um, it seems that the customers in this market are not so much optimizing for maximizing detection uh, or minimizing false negatives, but really they're optimizing for the workflow of their analysts. And they, therefore they want to reduce the number of false positives. We spoke to um, these 14 professionals and they confirmed that indeed um, uh, network detection was the main use case of uh, threat intelligence for them. Um, but we heard also examples of uh, other uses. For example, one organization used uh, threat intelligence to understand the level of um, crime in uh, a third country because they were considering doing a merge and acquisition there. Or um, uh, another organization was using uh, threat reports to understand the direction that development of their mobile banking application should take. Now, in these conversations with um, the uh, customers, we listened uh, and inductively gathered the, uh, the um, uh, quality perceptions and the terms that they used to describe threat intelligence as being valuable. And we uh, aggregated those into the categories 
uh, actionability, relevance, and confidence. Only one in five um, uh, customers said something about costs at all. So in conclusion, we present the first overview of uh, paid threat intelligence. We find almost no overlap um, with paid threat intelligence and open sources, suggesting it's really uh, a different beast. But um, we find also very limited overlap between two different um, threat intelligence providers, even though they are both leading providers. Um, this raises some questions about the coverage that these vendors are providing. But actually, the customers don't really seem to mind. Um, they're optimizing for the workflow of uh, their analysts rather than maximizing detection. And really, they have other use cases in which, for example, the comprehensiveness of a report is much more important to them. Um, last year at the CCC conference, um, uh, uh, CrowdStrike uh, senior director um, spoke about aggregating threat data and the role that um, commercial vendors, commercial threat inter vendors potentially have in overcoming the data sharing problem. This is very interesting. And uh, indeed, threat intelligence can be really helpful for um, network defenders. But based on our findings, we uh, question the coverage that these commercial vendors are really providing uh, on the threat landscape as a whole. Now, the uh, professionals don't seem to mind so much. And returning to the um, story about three private investigators, uh, in the absence of um, good information, a customer is likely to choose for um, uh, the most expensive option, the IBM effect. And um, uh, they do so because it signals quality. But in a market with asymmetric information, um, the willingness to pay of consumers might eventually go down because they cannot distinguish the good from the bad. And this effect is known as the market for lemons. And we discussed this also in the paper. Um, I thank you for your attention. I will take any questions in the Q&A. Uh, and I hope that you will read our paper. Thank you.